Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Talking to you today, October 18th, uh, 2015. Just probably about an hour before I actually upload this. Uh, talking today, uh, put this off for a lot of reasons. One, I'm lazy. Two, I had started a book and I kind of ended up skimming it for the most part and I was like, oh, I can get done with this one in time for the last one and I just barely did. So today we're going to talk about a few more books still in the year 1479. Not sure if I ever mentioned that switch over there. And of course, some of these are guesses, but uh, for all intents and purposes, that's where we are because some of them don't have dates. Let's talk about Spectral Blaze. That's the next book in the uh, Brotherhood of the Griffin series. This essentially wraps up the first trilogy, which has to do with Chisenta. Brotherhood is in Chisenta, and uh, there is this uh, three-part war that they're trying to solve, as well as being caught up in Jorventhal. The Game of Dragons, and it's really long and dull and confusing. That's about all I can say for it, and I was really, really frustrated, and I started skimming like crazy and basically got nowhere with this. Let me read you a note that I took that I think will explain a lot of my frustration here. So this is from 95% of the way through the book not sure how to pronounce this name. I'm just going to call him Charizard because he's a big flame dragon. Charizard is the king of Chisenta. He's the, the returned dragon who was their old time war hero and Gaiden and uh, Jezri bring him back from the Shadowfell at the end of book one. And then book two and book three are just lots and for the most part, lots and lots of wrangling to try to get him under control because he's seemingly batshit crazy. But in fact, what's going on is he's playing Jorventhal and he's playing a totally different game than taking care of where they live. Startled, Charizard whirled in her direction. Isn't it me you want most of all? She shouted. I did, the red dragon gritted. Blood pattered from his wounds down onto the ground. I loved you. I wanted to give you everything. I loved you too, she said. And I wanted to believe you could be the hero from the legends. But you can't. You were trapped in the dark too long and it broke you. Now there's nothing to do but put you down. Try, Charizard said. He started toward her. So there's nothing necessarily wrong about this interaction. It's just that I felt it should have come at about chapter six in book two, or actually since the chapters are ridiculously long or else the books are ridiculously short, maybe chapter three in book two. It's like books two and three are just over and over and over again them trying to dance around Charizard's obvious insanity and madness and stupid choice making and it's like why I don't understand why I, I I mean okay so he's a dragon right and it would be one thing if we built up to this fight against a dragon and it was this huge thing because I mean obviously fighting a dragon holy shit right but the problem is they go up against dragon after dragon after dragon through this trilogy it's like the idea of taking on a dragon, not that overwhelming for them. And i that's why it just felt like so ridiculously anticlimactic when they finally take him down. I mean, at least Byers puts in the whole, like, the, the entire city is in peril and all sorts of sides get in on the fighting and yada, 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 yada. So it's not just, like, them taking down a dragon like they have... God, it felt like a dozen times in this book. There were a lot of places where I was like, wait, am I just reading the Rage of Dragons trilogy all over again? Because it sure as hell feels like it. Ugh. So, yeah, as you can probably guess, I just didn't feel much with this book, and I was very frustrated because I, I really did like the first book, and I really did like a lot of the things that he was trying to do you know, like the giant political scale of everything and so on and so forth. But my problem was I'm reading these as ebooks and so I don't have a map that I can go back and look at easily and I'm not really great on geography in the realms and so I'm like wait where is this in relation to them and why should I care about these guys? Like I get that there's the Dragonborns over here and the Denazi over here. 
but where are they in relation to each other and are there other countries that we should worry about and so on and so forth and i just felt lost very quickly with all of that uh double crossing and everything and and the political stuff it just didn't gel very well for me and i think that was the thing that was there to appeal to someone like me the most so that didn't work just just so much didn't work and as i say the charizard stuff just it it feels like this should have been a two book series and instead it was three for some ungodly unknown reason then here's another quote from toward the very end of the book this is 98 percent of the way through and this is everything's back in order now and uh charizard's been taken down and the old war hero is put into place she says to jezri Although I am reinstating the old laws that regulated their, meaning the wizard's, conduct. So, everything's back to the way it was. Nothing has changed. The the reset button has, for all intents and purposes, been hit after this entire gigantic trilogy and all of these crazy political events that happen, and it's like... No, the wizards are still in their place, and uh, nothing matters. (laughs) Ha ha ha, have fun. So I felt really, really blue-balled by this series so far. I went in and read Masked Witches because I thought maybe it would provide something different, and I thought even if it didn't, I could at least just skim through it quickly. And yeah, I skimmed through it really fast. Uh, One thing that I liked, or a few things that I liked about it, First off, uh, Buyer switches it up a little bit. So this is like them going to try to get some griffins, but there are a lot of people who want griffins right now, so they have to kind of perform a quest to get the griffins and uh, uh, do it better than everybody else, essentially. And I like the fact that not everybody's there. It's just Alf, Sarah, and Jezri, and I think that's it. So Karun and uh, Gaiden are just not in this book, and uh, I I thought that worked well enough. I thought it was kind of interesting that they went that route. I liked the Stag King. There's this character who they go see and they have to beg his help. And it's like, hey, yeah, I'm this uh, rapist monarch. Uh, Cool, I'll fight with you. And they're like, awesome. And it's like, whoa, there's this weird moral (laughs) gray ground here. And there's also uh, a Berserker. And I like Berserker. So that was fun to have thrown in there. Of course, the two new characters that I like are mowed down by the end of the book. So it's like, well, all right, fair enough. Uh, It's, you know, let the dice fall where they may, right? But yeah, it just wasn't very... There wasn't much oomph to it. There was nothing to really drag me in. Though the end of it sees Al land back in Thay. So I'm a little bit curious to see where the next book, which I believe is the wrap-up. I think these are only... I I think the Brotherhood series is just five books where that takes us. The other thing is, I think I put these books way, way too soon (laughs) into 1479 because they talk about the last two years when they're talking about the events of uh, the first three books, and so I think these should have been toward the end of 1479. But for the most part, it's just a lot of fighting undead, and that just bores the hell out of me. So, whatever. The other book that I want to talk about is Hand of the Hunter. This is part two of The Chosen of Nendewin by Mark Zahested. So the first book ended and it was pretty exciting. Hwylan rips off Nendewin's mask and sees what he really is and she screams because she realizes that she's devoted to this guy now. And then book two starts off and it's pretty badass because it's like these uh, these people from a neighboring kingdom who come to help out Wylan and they come in and, you know, these, I don't know, hobgoblins or whatever attack him and halfway through the fight, Wylan comes in and just wipes the floor with all these other hobgoblins or maybe she, I, th- I think maybe she's like able to parlay with him and she's all like one with nature and you know she's fully become the hand right and it's like awesome we skipped all that boring ass like training stuff that's the same in every book and i really hate having to read over and over again and it's the most uninteresting portion of any sort of story and she has leandry or lendry there as this like undead wolf and it's like oh here's the ghost wolf that the cry of the ghost wolf must be about and that's really awesome and then after like one or two chapters Bam, it cuts to a flashback, and we go through all the training stuff that was ridiculously unnecessary. And so, like, 75% of the book is just pointless. I felt like it could have been maybe two chapters total thrown in here and there as flashbacks, and it would have been fine, but for whatever reason, it was decided to present it in this fashion. The one thing that I kind of like about the first half of the book 
is that we follow Huylen on one side, and on the other side, the, like, bad guy side, there's this uh, chick who's hunting her down, the like, one of the demon chicks from, you know, the Dark Dimension or what have you. And it did kind of feel like, oh, wow, I mean, this is kind of like... This has become a girls-only book, and that's kind of cool, you know? Not only is it a female protagonist, but it's a female antagonist as well, and so it felt like a diverse sort of portrayal of things. But it felt like fairly quickly that female is killed and whatever. But yeah, the end of the book is really exciting and fun, and Mendu Arthas comes back, and it's like, oh cool, this is such an interesting setup for how things are going to go in book three, and I'm excited to read book three, and Sehested's writing just honestly keeps getting better and better. But the plot was so dull for three quarters of the book that I just skim, 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 because it's like, I don't care. I just, I can believe that she became the hand. I don't need to see her, like, journey, because I know it's never going to be fully realized, because, you know, it's all about the little beats and everything, but whatever. So I made it through it. Uh, I'm still looking forward to book three, but yeah, if I ever reread this trilogy, totally skipping book two. Or at least skipping the main section of it. I'll read the Giant Spires section. A lot with the Feywild. We're, like, visiting the Feywild, like, every other damn book, and everybody keeps mentioning the Shadowfell. We went to it briefly in one of the Griffin books. I think the first one, the very end of it, we went to the Shadowfell. It certainly feels like they're kind of shoving 4E down our throats, but not necessarily in a bad way, so, meh. I'll be glad to get out of the Brotherhood of the Griffin series and get on to other things, maybe get a taste of some other writers. We've got some new writers coming up, and I'm pretty excited about that. We'll get one of them next time uh, with, uh, I believe it's Tim Pratt who did Venom in Her Veins, um, also Down Shadow, so that will be exciting, the start of that whole series. I've actually read <laughs> about half of the prologue so far, not very much. But it's like, oh, Down Shadow is actually the first few levels of Undermountain. So we're going to return to Undermountain at least briefly, and that's pretty cool. So kind of an anticlimax here. But anyway, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered. <laughs>